you still maintain that you did not commit these murders or the, the murder and the other crimes you were convicted of? Absolutely. I didn't commit them and I still maintain my innocence. The night you took your children to the hospital in Springfield, will you describe the events of that evening? Yes. My kids and I were sitting at home watching TV. We were watching Helen Keller, the Helen Keller story. I received a phone call from someone who said that he wanted me to come pick up some photographs for my boyfriend, not of my boyfriend, but for my boyfriend, Rick. Rick is a guy that I'd been dating for about six weeks, and he claimed to be an FBI agent. Whether or not he was, I don't know. I certainly never called him at work or showed up or made him prove it or show a badge. It didn't matter to me. I wasn't, <laughs> to me it was just all, it was just dating. But I received a phone call about 9.15 from someone who said I needed to come pick some photographs up for Rick. I piled the kids in the car. We went out to go meet this person to pick up the photographs. I stopped by Heather, wow, I can't remember Heather's last name now. I stopped by Heather's house because I'd been, I told Heather on the phone a few days earlier that I had a newspaper ad for her. So she had been wanting to buy a horse and this was a newspaper ad that would allow her to adopt a horse. So I had told her that I had a, that I had a newspaper clipping for her that I'd found at work. So as long as we were going out to meet this guy to pick up photographs, we went by Heather's house. Heather said, I already got a horse just the other day. So we went to see the horse. We got back in the car. We left. I went to meet this guy. Somebody in the road flagged us down. I stopped and got out of, the, got out of my car. And he said something to the effect of, I want your car. And I laughed at him. And I said, you've got to be kidding because in my mind, those kinds of things don't happen. In Arizona, those things don't happen. I don't know about Oregon, but in Arizona, those things don't happen. And so he jumped into the car, leaned into the car, and started firing the weapon. And it happened so quickly that by the time he stood up and faced me, it was over. I mean, it was just that fast. I, he said something about the car again, and I struggled with him. The gun discharged. He fell back. I jumped in the car, put the keys in the ignition, and took off. The car door shut by itself. That's it. And I went to the hospital. Christy and, Dan, uh, Christy and Danny were in the back seat. When we got to the hospital, they were still crying. Um, the nurses reported that they were still crying. The state says I that... I was the one that shot them and that I wanted them dead. If that was the case, I would not have taken to the hospital still crying. There are so many other ways to accomplish such a horrific deed if I was going to do it. I'm certainly bright enough to figure out another way besides some way that looks so absolutely insane and hokey that nobody would believe it. I'm not dumb. Ultimately, you told several different versions of the story when law, when law enforcement investigated this, correct? When you were when you talked not correct. Point, ultimately, well, what ha I, I understood that um, you told law enforcement that uh, this was done by two men with ski masks. This is what somebody told me. Hmm. This it. How do I explain this? After my children and I were attacked, the police kept saying, Diane, you must have lapses in your memory because there's holes in this you could drive a semi-truck through. None of this makes sense. Um, you're forgetting something. I believed, because I'd never had any dealings with authorities, and I believed the authorities, and so I thought they did, that I had lapses of memory. I can't tell you how the towel got around my arms, so I know from my own personal experience that I did have at least that much of a lapse of memory. I don't know how the towel got around my arm. So when I, I would have, what people would call me up and people would say, I know so-and-so and he said such-and-such. 
Um, well, I have a neighbor, another guy would call and say, I have a neighbor and he has a car that just looks just like that and he's been talking. These kinds of things were being said to me either by phone, people would stop me on my mail route, they would, I worked in Cottage Grove and people would drive all the way to Cottage Grove just to meet me on my mail route and tell me these kinds of things. So I would call the police or I would go to the police and I would say, these, I would say this is what's being told to me. Those are the kinds of things they would say that I changed my story. I wasn't changing my story. I was trying to help. The police kept saying I had lapses of memory. People were calling me and telling me things that I thought, well, maybe this is what happened that I don't know. And so I would tell the police, believing that I was helping them investigate. They didn't tell anybody that these are reports that I was giving them reports from other people. They would simply say, Diane came in and said such and such. The one about the ski mask was dreams that I was having. And they kept saying, well, maybe you forgot something. So when I would have a dream and I would wake up, I would think, well, maybe that's what I would forget. And so I, the ski mask story, I didn't tell the police. I was talking to somebody on the phone and I was trying to, and I was sharing this dream, this thought with somebody, trying to understand in the same way that you would talk to a psychologist or a psychiatrist so that you can, because if you talk, maybe you can reach something. Maybe you can find something that's inside you that's locked off. And so I was sharing this with somebody else and the police were tape recording those phone calls and then said, oh, there she goes. She changed her story. And that wasn't it. And they know that wasn't it. Okay. Well, ma'am, I guess perhaps you could clarify it for me because as you said, I'm, I am the newest person here and I'm asking you new questions. But when I'm reading the pre-sentence investigation and says, subsequently defendant gave a total of three different versions of the shooting, including that it was done by two men wearing ski masks and also that she knew the person who shot them. Um, did you not give three different versions of the story? The police said, strangers don't shoot strangers for no reason. So I believe this had to be somebody who knew me. They also, at one point, the last day that I got to see Christy in the hospital, I believe it was June 15th of 83, Doug Welch came to the hospital and said, Steve Downs did this. We know Steve Downs did this. You need to give us, you need to be willing to testify against him. I said, how do you know Steve Downs, my ex-husband? How do you know Steve Downs did this? Give me the evidence. He said, don't worry about the evidence. Just be willing to testify. I said, if you can't prove to me he did it, he's not the one that fired the gun. He said, but he was behind it. I said, I cannot testify against somebody unless you can prove to me that he did this. I know he hates me, but why would he hurt the kids? Doug Welch said, you better be willing to play ball or you'll never see your kids again. And I said, I cannot testify against somebody unless you can prove to me that he did it. The next day when I went to see my children, I was not allowed to see my children ever again. That gave me the belief that the police were absolutely convinced that somebody I knew did this. And if the police believed it, then I believed it. Now, if they want to turn this all around and say, Diane changed her story, that's not what happened. And you guys are on the parole board. And I know you work with the legal authorities. You work with police. You work with the, with the district attorneys. And so you know how they work. It's how they, I know now what they were trying to do. They were trying to scoop me into a corner so that, I don't know, so that I would say or do something that would incriminate me, which certainly worked. But, but that's not what happened. Though what I'm telling you is exactly what happened. Doug Welch came to the McKinsey, no, to the, uh, the hospital in Springfield. Oh, I can't even think. McKinsey Willamette. No, anyway, to the Springfield Hospital. He sat right there. He caught me when I was coming through the front door. He pulled me into the lobby. And these are the things he said to me. I went to see Christy for 15 minutes because that's all I was allowed. I left. And he was standing there and he goes, I'm not playing, Diane. And I said, prove to me Steve did this. He says, let us worry about the proof. And I said, I can't testify against him unless you can prove to me he did this. And I left. The next day, I did not see my children ever, ever again until court. And that was it. And so I believed. I believed what the police, I thought the police believed. Now, maybe they did believe that. Maybe to this day, they still believe it because... Fred Hughie was another time he told my attorney, Jim Jagger, Jim Jagger said, Fred, you know Diane is innocent. He said, I know that and you know that, but she's covering for somebody and as long as she's going to cover for somebody, she's going to do that person's time. 
Jim said, Jim Jagger said, go ahead. I said, so is it your, is it, is it what you're saying today is that the, the prosecutor in your case, the prosecutor in your case knew you were innocent yet in order to get someone else to convict someone else for this, he basically threatened to keep your kids from you in order to get you to make incriminating testimony against somebody else. Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that Jim Jagger told me Fred Hughey said this to him. I don't know that Fred Hughey said this. I have no reason to believe Fred Hughey said this now, but that's what Jim Jagger told me Fred Hughey said. So from that point on, I believed, should we? <laughs> from that point on, I believed that Fred Hughey believed that it was somebody that I knew. That's what I'm telling you. It, it, that is what shaped my belief patterns. And so when I would talk to the police, I spoke to the police as if it was somebody that was familiar to me. Not because I believed they were familiar to me, but because Fred Hughey told Jim Jagger and Jim Jagger, Jim Jagger told me that Fred Hughey told him this. I have no reason to believe Fred Hughey would do that. I don't. Fred Hughey adopted my children. I think during the trial, can I go ahead and jump ahead with this? Sure. That, okay. During the trial, at the very end of the trial, Fred Hughey, they brought in a mock-up of the car, and Fred Hughey got a gun, and he was reenacting the crime. And when he was going through the motions of firing the gun at the Christie doll and at the Cheryl doll and at the Danny doll, he couldn't shoot the Danny doll because the Danny doll was back here. And he raised up and he looked at me and I went like this. And he went, he, his face, he had a, fa a look of incredulation on his face and his mouth started to open and I nodded my head yes. And he had to switch the gun to the left hand. A right-handed person could not have shot the Danny doll. It was at that time, I don't think at any time before that did Fred Hughey believe that he was doing anything wrong. I think that he believed full bore that what he was doing was the right thing. But, and I'm not inside Fred Hughey's head, I don't have the right to speak for him and I won't speak for him, but it was after that he adopted my children and according to Christie, never said a bad word against me, ever. That was out of Christie's mouth. Fred Hughey, in all the time that he raised her, never spoke ill of me. I believe that Fred Hughey knows that there is a man out there that was hunting my children. And it wasn't until after Christy told her schoolmates that I, she, she drew pictures in school and she said, this is the man who shot us. I didn't, I lied in court because they wanted me to say this and they wouldn't leave me alone, Dr. Peters. She said, Dr. Peterson kept pressuring me and he wouldn't leave me alone. Those children, the Andresons, told their mother, their mother told her, the, um, the apartment manager, and the apartment manager told somebody. Now, he, he didn't tell my attorney until 1991, but he apparently told somebody before that. But it was at that time when Christy was in that school and classmates with the Andresen twins that Fred Hughey decided to adopt my children.